and welcome to episode 59 of This Week in Germany. We'll be bringing the world to Germany and Germany to the world with news for the week beginning the 16th of February 2015. My name's Daniel. And I'm Rob. Each week we bring you stories from news, society, and culture in the English language. If you want to find out more, including ways to follow us on Twitter, Spreaker, and SoundCloud, and now even Spotify, head over to our website, thisweekingermany.de. This week in Germany, Angela Merkel has had one of her busiest weeks in diplomacy to date as she travels across two continents to broker a ceasefire in the conflict in Ukraine. The country is known for its signature quality and craftsmanship. Psychologist Finn Rodloff talks about how this came to be. Our German of the Week is Olaf Scholz, the Social Democratic Mayor of Hamburg, whose party has won over 45% of votes in the city's elections on Sunday. For our destination this week, we take you to a large, beautiful forest in the bustling capital of Berlin. All that plus the rest of this week's news in brief, coming up. This week has been a busy one for Angela Merkel. She traveled across two continents to six different countries to broker a ceasefire in Ukraine. It's been a busy week for the Chancellor. If you want to hear more of this background, check out last week's podcast. To explain to us this busy week in diplomacy, we're joined by Joanna Slater, Berlin correspondent of Canada's national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. So, Joanna, last week, Angela Merkel and French President Francois Hollande traveled to Kiev and Moscow to broker a ceasefire. What came out of those talks? Basically, what came out of those talks was a promise to keep talking, and that's exactly what they did, agreeing to a summit the following Wednesday in Minsk. There was certainly a sense among the German and French governments that the violence in Ukraine threatened to really spin out of control, and that a last-ditch effort to forge some kind of agreement was a worthwhile, if uncertain, effort. So then, after these talks took place in Kiev and Moscow, Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, then traveled to the United States to speak with Barack Obama and then to Ottawa to speak to Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Um, was this an attempt to gain support for the diplomatic as opposed to the military method of dealing with the conflict? In short, yes. <laughs> there are a number of voices, both in Canada and the U.S., but particularly the U.S., who believe that the time has come to help Ukraine defend itself, uh, in other words, to supply uh, weapons or other military hardware uh, to the army there. Now, Chancellor Merkel, as you mentioned, has been quite clear, blunt even, uh, that such a step would not solve the conflict and would, in fact, be counterproductive. Uh, she and the Canadian Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, have quite a warm relationship uh, on this latest trip. Uh, he praised her. He called her a, a woman of great vision. Uh, he has taken uh, a harder line on Ukraine uh, than she has. Uh, in November, uh, memorably, at the G7 meeting, uh, he told Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, in person uh, to get out of Ukraine. Uh, but for now, both uh, Prime Minister Harper and President Obama are waiting to see if this latest ceasefire works. So you mentioned uh, the, the ceasefire agreement. So on Wednesday, um, a renewed agreement was made in Minsk. Could you tell us more about that? Sure. So as you mentioned, the most important part of the agreement was a ceasefire, which, as you and I are talking right now, has yet to go uh, in effect. It goes into effect at midnight tonight on Saturday uh, along roughly the current front lines in the conflict. The agreement also provides for the withdrawal of heavy weaponry uh, two days after the ceasefire. And down the line, it envisions changes to the Ukrainian constitution to offer uh, rebel-held areas more autonomy. Quite frankly, none of the rest of the deal really matters if the ceasefire collapses and there continues to be heavy shelling even with the ceasefire now hours away. And the previous Minsk agreement um, was also for a ceasefire, which wasn't um, – the, the, it ended up breaking up quite quickly, that ceasefire agreement. So what are the, the prospects for the future now in this conflict after this second agreement? Well, exactly. I, mean, I think that based on the past, it's hard to be optimistic. You know, the current agreement is not so different from the previous one signed in September, also in Minsk, and which was immediately violated. So finally, how and why has Germany specifically been so instrumental in this agreement? 
Look, I think Germany has been nothing short of pivotal here. Uh, Chancellor Merkel really drove the latest initial for, uh, sorry, initiative for dialogue uh, together with French President François Hollande, but really this is her baby. Uh, and it speaks to her deep involvement in the conflict, but also uh, her country's changing role. Germany is, you know, unquestionably, if reluctantly, uh, the leading power in Europe. And over the last week, you've seen it act accordingly. How has Germany re- reacted to Angela Merkel's position in this uh, negotiation where she's been flying um, through Europe and, and North America to broker this agreement? So what was the, the German opinion? I, I think you've seen pretty much a, a uniformly positive uh, reaction to uh, Chancellor Merkel's kind of dogged pursuit uh, of her policy aims, both in the press and even from her, you know, political rivals who have given her a lot of credit for really pursuing uh, a negotiated solution uh, to the ends of the earth or or across the earth. Uh, You've seen, as I say, uh, you've seen her described as, you know, the world chancellor in tabloids, uh, admiringly. Uh, I think the question becomes what happens further down the line. Right now, she really does seem to have the majority of the German electorate uh, behind her. But if this ceasefire falls apart and if there does uh, uh, become, if there does open up a rift between the U.S. and Europe in terms of strategy in Ukraine, uh, then it will be, I think, a little bit uh, harder for her for her uh, position to be uniformly positive, and it certainly would be a big blow to the kind of leadership that she's exercised uh, if uh, the negotiated solution falls apart. And if this works, and if Angela Merkel steps down at the next election, which she might, uh, this is legacy building stuff. If this if this works, absolutely right, absolutely right. I, I can't think of. Uh, another leader who has been in in quite such a crucible, not just one crucible, in fact, but two at the same time, both Ukraine and the Greece debt crisis. Uh, and I think uh, these are the, the what happens in both of those crises will go a long way toward determining her legacy as chancellor. So Joanna Slater from The Globe and Mail, thank you very much for joining us here on This Week in Germany. Thank you. If you'd like to follow Joanna's reporting from Berlin... You can find her on Twitter at jslaterNYC. And now for this week's News in Brief. This past week, Marcus Kama from the U.S. state of Montana was found guilty of killing a 17-year-old German exchange student. Karma was convicted and sentenced to seven years in prison for the shooting. Karma's girlfriend admitted that the incident was planned, that they had left the garage door open on purpose as well as leaving out a purse and other objects that a thief might find interest in. When the German exchange student, Darren Dita, and his friend entered the garage, admittedly looking for alcohol to take, Karma was notified via motion sensors he had previously set up. He opened the door to the garage and shot four times with a shotgun. Dita was hit and died at the scene, and his friend was able to run away. Karma's lawyer invoked the law known as the Castle Doctrine, which lets homeowners use deadly force to defend themselves against intruders. The judge did not see it this way, and thought Karma was doing something more close to hunting rather than self-protection. A commemorative ceremony was held in Dresden to mark the 70th anniversary of the days February 13th and 14th, when the Allied forces firebombed the city in 1945. Survivors of the attack, as well as foreign dignitaries, turned up to attend the ceremonies. German President Joachim Gauck spoke at the Frauenkirche, the church that had been completely destroyed and has now been reconstructed. His message was that the world should remember those that were killed both in Dresden and everywhere violence and war are waged. After Gauck's speech was finished, he took his place in the human chain being formed around the middle of Dresden as a symbol of unity and remembrance. This past Friday, Germany has said that it will close its embassy in Yemen, at least temporarily, due to the continued violence taking place in the country. A German foreign ministry spokeswoman said that the region was unstable, and revolt on the government by the Shiite militiamen was unacceptable and dangerous. Other countries, as well as Germany, 
have or are planning to leave Yemen as well. On Tuesday, this past week, a former prisoner has filed a lawsuit against the city of Berlin. His claim? That he has suffered during his time in prison due to the holding cells not being large enough, and that he had to spend too much time indoors. This former inmate is asking for 7,800 euros on the grounds of psychological distress. His cell was 5.8 square meters. Also adding to the stress is the claim that he was unable to adjust physically or move properly after spending 23 hours a day inside. The former prisoner held these conditions for eight months after being arrested for rape and then sentenced in 2011. The city of Berlin did offer him 600 euros, which he declined. And that's the news in brief. If you'd like a quick and simple way to keep up with the latest from Germany, sign up for our weekly email newsletter, which you can find on our website, thisweekingermany.de. And now psychologist Sven Rudloff will provide more insights into the German way of life and way of thinking. This time, the topics of Germany's proud history of craftsmanship and quality. Hello, my name is Sven, and every month I give you some insights on what it means to be German, with interesting stories about typical German things and the German psyche. Today I want to talk about German craftsmanship and quality. Germany has this long-standing reputation of being a country of excellent engineers and technicians building reliable machinery, including cars. Most of the names associated with the birth of the automotive industry are German. Daimler, Diesel, Otto, Benz, Porsche. And after a century, German cars are still seen as of high quality in international comparison. But one could also name Johannes Gutenberg as an example, the inventor of movable type. Not of the printing press, though. This had been around some time before Gutenberg. Or remember Werner von Braun, equally famous and infamous, who was involved in the development of rockets and missiles, first for the Nazis and then later for the Americans, up until the moon landing. Or take German technology companies like Siemens or Bosch, whose engineering services and products are asked for worldwide. The notion made in Germany on products has for quite some time been a seal of quality. But has this always been the case? No, quite to the contrary. It's probably not that quality is built into this German psyche, but more so the eagerness to organize stuff. Therefore, two things that actually help to make German engineering such a success story are standards and standardized education. The birthplace of the Industrial Revolution was Britain, but as industrialization spread across Europe and the US in the second half of the 19th century, other countries, including Germany, tried to imitate British products. The British were annoyed by the initial low-quality copies of their inventions. And in 1887, English Parliament passed the Merchandise Marks Act. From then onwards, all products sold in England had to bear the country of their origin, to make imports highly visible. This is where the Made in Germany seal comes from. But the British initiative against the cheap German copies backfired eventually. The Germans themselves had become annoyed by the low quality of their products. The German engineer Franz Rollo served as a judge at several international exhibitions of the time. After the World Fair in Philadelphia in 1876, Rollo famously scolded the products of his home country as cheap and bad. In the following years, several initiatives led to a remarkable improvement of German production processes and quality, mainly driven by the setting of common standards. For example, Rollo himself oversaw the introduction of a unified patent law across the German Reich. Organizations were formed to ensure the quality of technical equipment, like the predecessor of the German TÜV, the Technical Supervision Association. Most Germans mainly know the TÜV as the organization that checks your car for roadworthiness. However, the TÜV's objective is to oversee the safety of all sorts of technical equipment, from home appliances to industrial machinery. It was originally founded in the late 19th century to ensure the safety of the growing number of boilers and steam engines in Germany, following some devastating incidents. Over time, the TÜV's scope expanded with technical development. But only because you set a few new standards 
and introduce more regulation doesn't automatically result in widespread improved quality, you have to instill the new spirit into the people actually doing the work. Here is where the famous dual education system of Germany comes into play. Many countries very much focus their schools on equipping children for university only. If you are not qualified or interested in university, you may learn a craft instead. But this usually means that you mainly learn the actual handiwork of a graft, but forgo academic education altogether. In Germany, only one-third of children leaving school go directly to university, while two-thirds do an apprenticeship. This means that they join a certified program in which they work part of the week for a company that pays them and teaches them the relevant skills. The rest of the time they spend in school for further education, covering more academic skills around their chosen profession. This is what is meant by dual education system. You have both practical and academic parts. It's a very practical applied approach. At the same time, German apprenticeships are standardized across the country and highly recognized. And this brings us back to the German quality initiative of the late 19th century. By making safety and process improvement part of the respective apprenticeship curricula, Germany could educate within only a few years a new generation of quality-minded and qualified technicians. While some university-educated engineers may have set the course, it came down to the technicians, builders and administrative staff in factories to ensure that proper processes really became reality. And so it happened that by the time the English Parliament issued the Merchandise Marks Act, Germany was already overtaking Britain in terms of product quality, and the Made in Germany mark that was supposed to condemn products imported from Germany became a seal of quality worldwide, to this very day. However, there are two facts I also need to mention. First, while the foundation for Germany's industrial quality had been laid by the early 20th century, both world wars and their aftermath helped to grow it further. In 1917, the predecessor of today's German Institute for Standardization, abbreviated DIN, was founded, a central governing body for standards. You may know this abbreviation from the German paper sizes, like DIN A4. While the introduction of a central governing body for standards was a logical step in the further professionalization of German industry, the true reason was more specific. It was to focus all of Germany's industry to support the war effort. Similar organizational and regulatory measures were made before and during the Second World War. So, when Germany's industry was being rebuilt in the 1950s, this could be done based on a long history of established standards and experience across industry sectors. Finally, the German engineering focus hasn't always been positive. There are many examples where Germans over-engineered something. They made it too good or too complicated for actual use. Appliances may be clever and long-lasting, but when they eventually break, you often need a specialist or even the original manufacturer's help to get them repaired, if this is even possible. So, sometimes we overdo it with our focus on quality and organization. So it may not come as a surprise that after four years in the UK, I often wanted to tell the British colleagues, couldn't you be a little bit more organized? While at the same time I wanted to tell my German colleagues, couldn't you just relax a little bit? How about we try to keep the balance? Then we would be all better off, I think, and made in Germany or made elsewhere wouldn't matter so much anymore. If you'd like to hear more of Sven, check out his German language podcast about the UK, Viva Britannia, at vivabritannia.de. And coming up right now is Destination Germany. We're taking you on a journey somewhere in the country that is well worth a visit, whether you're a tourist or a permanent resident, a foreigner or a German citizen. We'll be covering the famous sites as well as those little-known corners of Deutschland. All that matters is showing you that Germany is an interesting and exciting place to visit. And if you enjoy the destinations that we talk about each week, check out our website, thisweekingermany.de, and we'll have photos of each week's destination. 
And if you missed last week's destination, Germany, we talked about the East Frisian Islands. There are lots of reasons to visit these islands, but one of the most interesting is that during low tide, the water leaves an area between the mainland and the islands, which allows the visitors the opportunity to go on a guided tour and actually walk between the mainland and the islands. That's pretty cool. Also, the islands are known for holding on to their rural roots. Bring your walking shoes, as there are no cars on many of these islands. But as for this week, what are we going to see, Rob? It could be a little bit of a stretch, but we're going to another island. This island is the is a German state completely surrounded by another German state. I'll give you a hint: it's not Bremen. Okay, you can probably guess that our destination this week is in the state of Berlin, and more specifically, we're going to look at Berlin's largest wooded area. And before you shout out the Tier Garden, our green Berlin destination is much larger than that. It's Grunewald. The Green Forest. As someone who lives in Berlin, this area is not completely unknown to me. But、um, I bet it is for many that don't live here. They they might think of the the Tiergarten and the city centre、um, parks and and woods before they they think of Grunewald. So maybe you could tell us where、uh, this place is compared to the Berlin that、uh, everyone knows. The state of Berlin is broken up into twelve different districts. The district that most people think of when they think of Berlin is Mitte. That's pretty much right in the middle of the state. If you travel a little way southwest of the center, you'll reach the Berlin district of Charlottenburg-Wilmersdorf. One of the six localities in this area is Grunewald. Getting there isn't hard. From the central train station in Berlin, it's only about a thirty-minute train ride. So now we know where it is. Why is Grunewald our destination of this of this week? What can one expect from a visit there? The reason I chose it was because, probably like many, when I thought of Berlin Park and Forest Land, I thought of the Tier Garden, and I thought it to be pretty large. But to put Grunewald in perspective, the Tier Garden is just over 200 hectares, while Grunewald is about 3,000 hectares. There is plenty to see and do here, especially if you like walking and hiking in the forest. There's a good mix of areas to take leisurely and scenic strolls through, and more intense and strenuous hikes. One of the treks that can really get your blood flowing is going from Track 17 at the Grunewald train station to the nature preserve at Okoverk. From there, a trip up Teufelsberg. So that sounds pretty specific. So, and I assume there's some interesting things along the way. Why would one want to take that specific hike? Well, Track 17 at the Grunewald station is actually a built-in memorial to 50,000 Jews who were deported to concentration camps between 1941 and 1945. The track that you walk along marks the times and destinations of these different trains. It's kind of like walking on a large outdoor timeline. After walking along the memorial, you can start towards the nature preserve center called Okovik. This area is filled with gardens, wildflower patches, orchards, beehives, ponds, and is right on the Teufelsee. If you go on a weekend, there's an outdoor cafe to stop and have a snack. If you feel adventurous, you can climb the steep hill to Teufelsberg. This is a Cold War listening post operated by the Americans to spy on the East Germans and their communications. As this is a large forested area, I assume there are other places to walk or hike as well. Yeah, there are quite a few different trails and outdoor destinations that you can find in Grunewald. I can't mention them all, but I will point out a couple of exciting ones that you might want to see. There's a huge sandpit called the Sandgruber. Gruber. 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 This was made when sand was being collected to help build the city during the late '60s to early '80s. Kids love rolling around and sliding down these sandy slopes. The Grunewald Tower is on a hill right along the River Havel, and other than getting a great view of the river going through this wooded area, on clear days you can also get a great view of the Potsdam area in Berlin. When should one go to Grunewald? Should visitors try and make it for a specific time? Is one time as good as another, or how is it? It's hard to say when the best time would be because something seems to always be going on during every season. In the winter, there are the winter and Christmas markets in December. There are spring festivals, summer events, and the leaves in the fall are really worth seeing. It's pretty accessible, so my plan is to try and take some time on a Saturday to visit this area in each season. Next up, our German of the Week section, where we put the spotlight on a prominent person from this week's news, a German citizen, or even a foreigner who we deem an honorary German, who has had an effect, for better or worse, on German culture, society, or politics. This episode, our German of the Week is Olaf Scholz. Scholz is a politician in the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, and he has been the mayor of Hamburg since 2011. 
He started out after high school by studying law. He completed his law degree in 1985 and then worked in Hamburg as a lawyer and a partner in the firm Zimmerman, Schultz, and Partners. He knew that he was interested in politics from an early age. He joined the SPD as a high school student in 1975. From 1982 until 1988, he was the Deputy National Chairman of the Social Democratic Youth Organization, as well as being the Vice President of the International Union of Socialist Youths. In 1994 until 2000, he held the position of chairman of the SPD district in Hamburg, Altonia. And in 2000 until 2004, he was the regional chairman of Hamburg. In 2009, he was elected by the SPD as the five deputy national chairman. On Sunday, elections were held in Hamburg, where the SPD came out way in front, with the ZDF reporting over 46% of the votes going to the center-left party, a confident victory, though not enough to achieve an absolute majority. Still, it is more than enough to confirm Schultz's re-election as the mayor of Germany's second largest city. And that's the end of episode number 59. We'd like to thank all of you for leaving your ratings and reviews on iTunes. This five-star review from Knilchlich in the German version of iTunes reads, Dieser Podcast ist nicht nur sehr informativ, auch für Deutsche, sondern auch noch unterhaltsam und nicht selten witzig. Die beiden Moderatoren, Rob und Daniel, erstere Amerikaner, letztere Brite, verstehen es auf unnachahmliche Weise mit Charme und so manch augenzwinkenden Unterton Deutschland aus der Außensicht darzustellen. And translated into English, this review states, This podcast is not only informative for Germans too, but it's also entertaining and funny. The two presenters, Rob and Daniel, the former an American and the latter British, understand how to present Germany from an outsider's perspective, with inimitable charm and sometimes with a winking undertone. Vielen Dank für deine Resension, Kindischlich. If you're an iTunes subscriber, please leave us a five-star rating and review. It's one of the ways you can support our podcast for free and it helps us find more listeners. Plus, we might even read them on the program. This Week in Germany is produced by me, Daniel Winter. It is written and presented by myself and Rob Bishop. And our correspondent this week was Joanna Slater. You can follow her on Twitter at jslaterNYC. And thank you, Sven Rudloff, for appearing on our program this week. You can listen to his German language podcast about the United Kingdom at vivabritannia.de. Rob, I want to ask you a question. Do you like German music? I do. Well, we now have a Spotify playlist of modern German music, so no David Hasselhoff and all that rubbish. <laughs> Actually, genuinely good modern German music. You can find the link to that on our website. Along with ways to get in touch, subscribe to us on iTunes, get weekly email updates, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Spreaker, SoundCloud, everything is at thisweekingermany.de. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next Monday with more from This Week in Germany. Mm-hmm.